Injection is a type of attack that occurs when a web application accepts user input as code. So what the attacker will do, they'll access a web application and they'll type in their input, but instead of a normal input like their name or email address, they'll type in a string of code. A couple of different protocols are susceptible to injection type attacks. Most common attacks occur with SQL or structured query language with a language used for databases. Lightweight Directory Access Protocol or LDAP is another such protocol and even operating system commands can be injected into web applications. So doing injection attacks allows attackers to gain information that they might not normally have access to. They might be able to ex execute a can uh, commands with SQL to view different values within the directory or even to have the database say drop tables or delete data. So this would be an attack on availability. The main way to prevent these types of attacks is to perform what's called a whitelist or a blacklist. A whitelist is a list of commands that are allowed within the application and a blacklist is a list of commands or characters that are not allowed. The apostrophe is notorious, especially with SQL, for injection attacks because the apostrophe is used to perform uh, many different data calls. So just by making it impossible for attackers to input an apostrophe into your web application, you've taken a great step into securing that application. Also, uh, security testing, both static and dynamic security testing, that's either DAST for dynamic or static would be SAS. That type of testing helps secure web applications from these types of attacks. Broken authentication is a term for a variety of security vulnerabilities. Uh, first one would be credential surfing, where attackers are able to use known or commonly used passwords, weak passwords, for example. If you're using on your web application or on your, your system, uh, the password is password1 or password with a capital P and exclamation point. This can be very easily guessed by an attacker leading to credential stuffing. Brute force attacks are when attackers try many different combinations, many different password attacks on the same system to try and guess the password. And we'll get into this a little more detail later in this domain. Weak passwords, like we talked about password or password one, uh, these are also, it's kind of goes hand in hand with credential stuffing, using those commonly known passwords or weak passwords, even default passwords. So many devices start with the default password of admin with the password being admin. So if the attacker would definitely try these types of passwords and usernames first when trying to break into a system. And then weak password encryption is when passwords are stored either on a website in plain text within the code, uh, within the website's code, or they are they're transmitted in clear text, so if attackers are sniffing wire traffic, wire wireless traffic, they're able to find that password with a simple search function and then use it in subsequent logins. A man-in-the-middle attack is a type of attack where the attacker places themselves in between the user and legitimate resource. And what they do is they sniff, they intercept communications between that target and the user. So the attacker can choose either to just passively read the messages or read the communication. They can also do something more malicious where they intercept the communication then alter it in some way to benefit the attacker. Uh, this is particularly dangerous, say, with financial transactions. Say you log on to your banking web application and you make a request to your bank to transfer $500 to your savings account. If you have an attacker who's in the middle of the, those uh, communications, that attacker can not only stop that transaction, but they could alter it and say, instead of transferring to the savings account, I want to transfer it to this external account, maybe to the attacker's benefit. 
This is easily conducted using unsecure Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi in public places where your internet connection is dependent on a Wi-Fi that you don't normally uh, trust. An attacker can insert, they can connect to the same Wi-Fi network, say at a hotel, and then look for traffic along that network and try and find individuals who are accessing either you know, financial institutions or email accounts or conducting some sort of sensitive business over that wireless communication. Man the browser is similar to man the middle, but this is where the attacker has in, inserted themselves into the user's browser. And this requires the attacker to install some sort of malware onto the target device first to gain access to that browser and be able to intercept the communication. Functions pretty much the same, but the attacker needs to have access to the system, not just the network. Again, this is commonly used with financial fraud and can be either targeting uh, a company, you know, a company's financial department, or just individual users as they do online banking or say they have a, a cryptocurrency account and they're trying to transfer money into their uh, cryptocurrency account to buy X number of cryptocurrency. The attacker can change those requests to maybe transfer X number of cryptocurrency to the attacker's external digital wallet. That's a very common attack within the past three years. Buffer overflow. This is a type of attack that takes advantage of data overflows within a system. So when data is transferred from one storage mechanism to another, to one buffer to another, uh, there's, if you try to transfer more data than the new buffer can store, you have what's called buffer overflow and that extra piece of data, it can, cannot be stored in that buffer and then it's placed somewhere else. So because of this, attackers are able to append malicious code on the end of these um, data strings and then that code, instead of being stored in the intended location, will be stored in another location. So attackers, here's the example. It's better to go with the example. Uh, C and C++, these programming languages are the most common buffer overflow attack vectors. So here we have a, a C string, okay? And we have our first variable A, and this is just a placeholder basically. It has a null value. So this is hexadecimal code down at the bottom here, okay? and the code for zero is just zero, zero. So the attacker will have this code, a null value with filled up with zeros, and at the end, this B section, they might have a piece of malicious code or that could be transferred outside of the intended buffer. And here we have 2020, which is hexadecimal code 07 and E4, okay? So with this, does is the attacker is able to, when that string is transferred, this uh, B portion, since there's no, there will not be enough space in that new buffer to store it, it will get stored somewhere else outside of that buffer. It will overflow that buffer, if you will. And the intent there is that attackers will replace this B string with pieces of malicious code that will then be reassembled or transferred to an area outside of its intended target. This can be particularly concerning when it comes to a cloud environment. In a cloud environment, you would have multiple tenants, multiple uh, customers, all stored on the same server. And because of that, even though each tenant or each user to that server just sees their storage space, an attacker might rent a portion of that storage space and then use this type of buffer overflow attack to either gain access or inject malicious code into someone else's space, someone else's virtual partition. And in that way, they can gain access to different people within that cloud environment without their knowledge.